once a year I get a, something in my voice. <clears throat> it's here today. And so I was hoping not to have the Pentecostal group when I got up here after worship. But uh, I'm not so sure I didn't strain, a, strain something in there. <laughs> this morning's message is brought about because of the place we find ourselves in it, it, with, with the Lord. And um, as a church and as a staff, you know, uh, just talking to a lot of you and um, uh, just how challenged we are with the, with the message that Pastor Brandon brought just weeks ago on Pride, and that's still ringing. It's ringing everywhere. Everybody's having to deal with it, and, uh, and we're still dealing with it. And it, it is, you know, Pride's really a place where you're making sure that you have a dependency on God and not a dependency on what you can do or, you know, over, over emphasizing self a little bit. So, you know, we've been dealing with that, and, and uh, there was a passing of the mantle at the uh, men's retreat, uh, kind of with with Michael and Nathan that went on, and then and then we kind of brought that into the whole body where we you know we believe that there's a calling on this church, and then there's an anointing God has for us to to begin to move out in. Well, ever since I've used the term anointing, we've had a lot of folks come and say, you know, what what does that mean? You know, and based on your background, you have all kinds of different definitions of what that might mean, and so. And so I just want to clear that up right here from the beginning of, of, of what that means again. And we're, gonna, we're just going to keep talking about it until we get it. We did that with grace for years and years and years, understanding you know, what grace would, really was, was the power of God working in our circumstances that does more than we can do on our own. It's unmerited, but it's more than unmerited. It is, it is the power of God, which is the anointing. In other words... This church has purpose in the eyes of God. Would you agree? Yes. We have purpose. And, and, and there's going to be an anointing. There's going to be a power. There's going to be a grace that comes on us to accomplish the purpose. That's all anointing is. It's not this magical, special thing that he's got called out. He's, he's just going to, his presence is going to come and be with us and lead and guide us by his grace to accomplish the mission that he set before us. Everybody got that? Is that good? We, we all tracking on that? Cool. So, with that in mind, and um, with the idea of this this going into a new season, this new wine and new wineskin, that's kind of what we feel like, isn't it? That there's this new wine coming, that there's this new season coming. And it is. I mean, we can see the changes that are going on, although they might be slow. There are changes going on. Uh, next week, they're going to move a lot faster, weather permitting. Everybody say weather permitting. There is a mud hole out here in the, in the side over here, and they're supposed to move in the next two weeks. They're supposed to move every one of those units and have them in place. And so, and so you know, that's kind of, it's kind of like, and the city has said within three weeks we're going to have water up here. And so all that's coming, I mean, it's, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to start popping. So God obviously is doing something, but... Uh, as I'm preparing this message and I'm thinking about this and as I'm thinking about myself and, I, and I'm hearing what some of you guys are going through uh, and, I, and I partner that with what I hear from some parachurch organizations that I, I'm very familiar with. I'm even on the board of one of them. And, uh, and, and then uh, just talking to them and I was down and, and watched uh, the Hilshers, Hilser, Hil, 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 whatever their name is, Helsers, yeah, that's it, down in Charleston this week. Uh, Dr. Joe and Heidi brought in the movie Finger of Finger of God to you. About 50 plus of you watched that on Friday night and really got vision on that. It was, it's an amazing thought process of getting out of these four walls and, and doing that. But anyhow, I'm combining all these thought processes with, with what I hear parachurch visions are. E every time I hear a parachurch ministry vision, this is what I hear. I hear discipleship. And every time I listen to one of them, I'm going, you just described the church. Well, the truth of the matter is the church isn't really doing that, and so there's parachurch ministries popping up everywhere trying to do what the church is supposed to be doing to start with. 
and that is to make disciples. That, that is to raise up leaders under you. Now, that's not me. I, I'm to administrate that. You're to do that. And the church just needs to awaken to the idea, to the call of God on the, on, on the church to begin to do what he uh, commissioned the church to be. And that's the anointing that's coming on this place. We're going to make it really clear of, of our mission as an organization of God, the, 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 the bride of Christ, what, what he called us to do, and that is to make disciples. Now, I say that to say this. Not only are you supposed to know the character and nature of God, you need to know who you are in him, and you need to know his way. And not only that, you need to be committed to his way. And then you need to begin to raise up little yous. And you do that in here and out there. You, don't, you do it everywhere you go but it, because it becomes who you are. And we see that with Paul and Timothy. And that's why we're going to read, read Timothy. But before I do, I want to kind of set the stage for what's going on and, and what we have to deal with and why it's so important for all of us to understand the nature and character of God and who we are in God. Now, don't, don't lose. This is so important. Don't let all my words lose you. I want you to track with me. I want you to do your best to focus on this because this is, this is absolutely humongous. Because I think we mystify and I think the church is, has, has missed a mark in so many different arenas that we've really got to know the Word and know God to actually get on track and, and to follow Him closely as individuals, which He wants you to do by His grace and by His power. Let me give you a few examples. You know, we first of all, the kindness, we talked about it last week. There's a mystifying of kindness of God. There's a mystifying defining of the love of God. There, there's, a, there's a mystifying of the miraculous of God. I loved what you said, Stephen. Don't, don't, don't let me impose my time frames on you, God. Oh, what a great word. That was a word from the Lord right there. I mean, it, had, it was just, and, and, and uh, what, you were, what you were saying as well was just like, if y'all heard that, that had a prophetic edge. I want you to begin to identify those things that have a prophetic edge on them, that, that are the word of the Lord that's coming forward. We don't have to say, thus saith the Lord. Just be looking for the Spirit to be on something that aligns with the truth. <clears throat> so I say all that to say this. Paul writes to Timothy in his last day, it was in between, we believe, between 66 and 67 A.D. At the latest, Paul was beheaded. Do you want me to repeat that? He was beheaded in 67. And so we have all these ideas about healing and the nature and the character of God. And, and, and like you said, Stephen, you know, I'm complaining about not being able to get rid of a cough or my time frame. And when I start thinking about what Mary had to endure, and then I impose all these things on God, because I don't have a real understanding of who God really is, and I loved your prayer, Lord, thank you that there's somebody that understands you better than me, but I'm committed to understanding you more. You know, when I look at Jeremiah, and I'm all in Jeremiah, so you might want to read Jeremiah right now. It's a long, it's one of the longer prophets, but it, it's just a, if I'm reading about today's church. But he says this, I want you to get a hold of the nature of God and how it hasn't changed. God didn't get saved. I hear oftentimes you hear people say, well, we're living in the New Testament. Well, it's not the new law. And Jesus didn't come to take away any of the law. He came to fulfill it, give us the power to actually accomplish it, to actually do it. Not the ones the Pharisees added, just the ones God established. Less the dietary ones because he pulled those out and with Peter when he lowered the animals down into the deal and so on and so forth. But I say that to say this. In Jeremiah, he said, come to me, people, church. Come to me. 
I want you to draw near to me. And James, it says, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. This, this call of God to the church that's always been, it's always been, come to me, come to me, come to me, come to me. <laughs> I've got great things for you. Come to me. In this thought process of God, I've got this image of this overzealous set of grandparents at Christmas who buy their grandkids way too much stuff. And I see us having a God like that. He's an overzealous father that gives us way too much. But he only gives it to us when we come to his house, when we, not this house, his, when we draw near to him. And this is what he said. Let me, let me give you this scenario of Jeremiah. And the reason I want to give it to you is because I want you to understand how God works with you. He says this, come to me, church. Put your name in it. Come to me, Alex. He says, draw near to me. Because you haven't been doing that and because you've allowed the world's way of thinking to come into your thinking and because you've resisted me and rebelled against me, then you're going to go into captivity. I'm going to put you there. And you're going to stay there. You're going to be in this place where you're being chased by the king to kill your baby. You're going to be in this place that you don't understand why you're there. But listen, while you're there in this place of misunderstanding that we're giving the devil credit for, draw near to me. And he says this to the church in Jeremiah, says, you draw near to me in that place of captivity and I'll bring peace to you there. Where you are in that place I'll meet you there. You draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. Now, if you bring, if you make that a habit, I'm an overzealous granddaddy. This got all this and what I promised you, all these blessings, I'm going to lavish them on you. And he says this, I'll bring you peace and I'll bring it to you through my servant. This is what God says, my servant, Nebuchadnezzar. the one who destroyed Jerusalem. You see, it doesn't matter what your circumstances are. If you'll draw near to God, he'll be in your midst. Now, the reason I'm telling you all this is because, you know, I just don't want you to think, well, that's this, that's the Old Testament or this New Testament. I just want to clarify this. Paul is writing this to Timothy, this message to Timothy, and in that place, he's in prison. He's not only in prison where people can visit, he's in prison where people can't visit, and the, really the only one there is Luke. And Luke is there with Paul, and Paul knows he's going to die. Matter of fact, Paul is ready to die. And he's writing to Timothy, and he said, Timothy, uh, you know, there's this, there's this thing, and we're going to read it here in a minute, that I want you to understand that there's this calling on your life that you need to begin to walk in and, and be careful. Be careful that you do exactly, that you pursue the Lord in such a way that you can actually fulfill it. It's not a guarantee. And he says, you've seen all these people, all these people that used to be part of the church. They're not here anymore. They've, they've abandoned ship because it got tough or because they didn't see God do what we were preaching. And, and, and he he never loses the idea that God is actually going to do his word even when he's in prison waiting to be beheaded. When he's writing to Timothy, he is expecting the word of God to come to fruition. And yet, his head was cut off with a sword. Again, Stephen, I want you to picture bending over probably hands tied behind his back 
or maybe even over a split rail fence kind of thing. Where was God? Where's the God who heals? Where's the God who protects? You see, if you, if, if you don't know him, you could lose sight that no matter whether that happened to Paul or not, he is still our protector. And that we can still walk in faith that he's going to do those things. Just because Paul didn't get healed or because the church in Jeremiah was in captivity doesn't mean that God is no longer our deliverer. He just didn't deliver on the time frame that was requested. He delivered in his own time. For those who in the midst of their hurt and pain and situation drew near to him. And believed him when they didn't see anything that would appear to be the hand of God. And in Hebrews, he says, that is the definition of faith. Faith is believing the word of God when you don't see it happening. So combine that with the idea, and we're going to read, I promise we're going to read 2 Timothy. Combine that with the idea of what we showed Friday night in actually going out and praying for people, being a testimony and a witness of God, of Jesus. Are we praying? The command by the disciples, which was in the apostles, which was Paul was included was go, pray for the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, present the message of the cross. Right? Those things. And every one of them died except John, a martyr's death. For the gospel. So, Wonder if God doesn't heal. Wonder if we pray for someone and God doesn't heal. Are you going to shrink back and not pray for any more people because it's too risky? Or are you still going to believe that the word of God is going to come true and continue to do so and then watch? Us? See, what devil wants to do is make you quit. He wants to make you stop and not believe the word of God because of what you see. And so there's this place of discipleship that God wants us to get to, this place of maturity that God wants us to get to. And there's really two kinds of people in the room. Um, the first is a people who want the benefits of God and what the Word produces without actually knowing God well or getting in His Word. There's so many people in the church like that. That as if coming to church was actually going to stimulate this blessing that God wants to pour out and release the grandpa gifts and not know your God or not know his word or his way. I, I just want you to understand <laughs> this is the word of God. It's God's word, <laughs> the creator of all things, his word. Ah, it's hard to read. <laughs> ah! You're kidding me. sleeper. So he writes to Timothy. I told you we was getting to it. 
from that place, Paul writes to Timothy, and I'm going to just go through some things real quickly that I, I want us to understand about what, what I'm seeing in this, in this place. This, this, Michael, this is an impartation. This is a guy who's about to die, and he's imparting on the next, the, the next generation. And he's not even seen this guy do anything yet, really, except for have a heart toward God. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, he was an apostle, according to the promise of which is in Jesus Christ. Christ meaning anointed one. So you could say, which is in the anointed one, Jesus. To Timothy, a beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, I just want to, uh, to as, we, as we talk about this and as we enter into this, I don't want it to be heavy. This is not to be heavy. This is to be... Uh, joyful because he says that word grace actually has this picture of being happy. <laughs> I thank you, God. I'm happy, God, for correction. I'm happy to, to, that you love me enough, you're kind enough to me, that you actually allow my sin to correct me, that you just don't let me die in it, that you rescue me. And I just realized that I didn't do number two. There's number one, and that's the person who really needs to get to know God. You've made a commitment to Christ, but you really don't know the Word and you don't know God. And you need to make a commitment to those two things. The other thing is, maybe, maybe you've known the Word, maybe, maybe you're not in the Word, and you know you can get right back in it, but you've got this feel for the Word, you, you, gotta, you, you know the Lord pretty good, but you, need to, you know you need to mature, or you've done it for years and years and years, and you're mature. Listen. God wants to do something in you, and he wants to put new wine in you that, that he's going to uh, give you a task and an assignment that I don't care how long you've been following God, you can't do unless God shows up. He's calling you to do something that you need to depend on him about. Now listen to me, and, and it's no different, it's no different than, than the immature believer who just doesn't even, even it's just trying to, to learn how to follow God or just trying to get rid of stuff in their life or, or trying to break free from captivity. There's no difference in that and a mature believer in this aspect. This immature believer has to do the thing that can actually bring success. If, if you want success in your finances, you, there's things you have to begin to do budget-wise to make sure that you're not spending more than you're bringing in. I mean, there's some, there's some tangible things we need to do. And the same is true for the mature believer to, to reach the call that God wants you to, to reach, to, to, to begin to be victorious in the purpose as a mature believer that he's called you to. He's going to stretch you out. <laughs> that was a 12-year-old voice. <laughs> he's going to stretch you out. Into, into something you've never done. So he can reveal more of himself to you so that you can actually accomplish what he's called you to. And it's not going to be you that accomplishes it. It's going to be the grace of God, which is the uh, anointing, the power of God working in your life because you did the thing that he asked you to do. And a lot of times that is boldness. As they prayed for an act, God give me the boldness to do these things in the world. If you were here Friday night, you saw that, that these guys went out on an evening and, they, and they, they didn't have where to go. They didn't exactly know what to do. They had just begun to pray and they were praying in the Spirit and they were giving their night to God. All they did was say, God, this night is yours. We'll go anywhere you tell us to go. We'll do anything you ask us to do. We're just focused on doing what you said. Our night is your night. This is our party night, God. We're going to go party with Jesus. And we're going to get instruction from the Lord, and we're going to do those things as we hear them. But let me just tell you this. You can't do that if you don't know the voice of God. 
You can't do that if you hadn't committed your life to the Word. You can't do that if you're not immersed in Him, if you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit. So, Paul's saying this to Timothy, who probably is somewhere in between, you know, he's, he's, He's not a, he, he's in the word, he loves the word, he's, he's weeping when it comes to the things of the Lord, and Paul sees that, and sees that he's got a heart for God. He says this, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day. I pray for you all the time, Timothy, greatly desiring to see you, being reminded of the tears and you know, I just get a picture of, you know, uh, just somebody who is being engulfed by the presence of God who's weeping. I, I mean, I watched Don Potter again in second service, and I watched him sing in the garden, and he couldn't hardly even sing it. And the Spirit of God just came on. He's, he's, he told us that Jeremy Riddle, Jeremy Riddle was in such a place with the Lord that he can't hardly even talk because he just, hmm. And I see that in Timothy, just a heart for God. And, and then he says, I, I want to see you that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelled first in your grandmama. So you see this passing down to a next generation, Lois, and your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded it's also in you. In other words, he hasn't even seen the fullness of what he saw in Lois, but, but he's seen the heart for it. He's seen the tears. It just hadn't quite manifested the way it did in Lois yet. But Paul's saying, I know it's in you. I, I know it's in you. You got a you got an you got a, a heritage. And so so that I know that that's in you also. Therefore, I remind you, the reason that I'm saying this is I want you to stir up that gift of God which is in you. And it's in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. And so what we see in here is the first thing that I want you to get is the church is not called to evangelism. The church is called to discipleship. And when you're discipled correctly, you can't help but evangelize because you're going to testify of what Jesus did. I love what Dr. Joe said yesterday. We're talking on the phone. And he said, a, a witness is, is not to go out and do something. A witness is to testify of what they know to be true. I know this to be true about my God. Why? I witnessed it. I witnessed his goodness. I witnessed his protection. I witnessed his love. I witnessed his healing. I witnessed all those things. When one of the things aren't going perfect, don't impose your timing on God, but don't lose your faith in the word. Declare the word of God until you see it. And die doing it. Yes, because it's true. And Paul is telling Timothy, stir that up in yourself. Not my job. I do my best. I, I try to mess with y'all as much as I can. <laughs> By preaching the word. But you have to stir up the gift that's in you. You have to stir it up in you. What is that? You have to stir up this, this pursuit of God. There's only one thing God requires. Draw near to me. God said, you draw near to me, and I'll draw it. Say that with me. Draw near to me and I'll draw near to you, God says. We have one thing that God is asking us. Draw near to me. Draw near to me. 
I've got a granddaddy sized blessings. Come to my house in my presence, and I'll bless you. But it has to be a lifestyle. It can't be a two-week experiment. And then you throw your hands up in the air and say, I don't see no blessings. He knows what's in our hearts. He knows the thoughts and the intent of our heart. He knows where you're going. Well, I'll give this a shot for about two weeks and see if God shows up. He don't. I'm going to tell him that the pastor's full of mud over there at east side. He don't know what he's talking about. Paul's saying to Timothy, listen, Paul, you you, you've got to stir this up in you. How did it come? It came because we laid hands on you and because you have a heritage. You know the truth. You've got a heart toward God. You've got to keep pushing on that thing. You've got to keep stirring that thing up so that you can live because God has not given you a spirit of fear. And I want to say something about this. This seems to be rampant. I just saw this morning with the admiral over the fleet in the Red Sea area committed suicide. There's just, and it had to be evoked from, from a place where he, he, he didn't feel like he could accomplish. The, there was just too much on him, too much dependency where there was just too much weight. Some, some reason. He had to come to that conclusion, and that's brought about by fear. Now, you, you may have a personality that has, is bent toward fear, but here's the anointing, and Paul is saying, here's the anointing for you. I've got an anointing for you, and you've got to stir it up. And when you stir it up, you're going to discover that, that it's not an anointing of fear. Instead, it's an anointing of power, of love, agape. You have the love of God that you can stir up in you and begin to show others. And there's this grace that is available to you, which is the power of God to work in your circumstance to do more than you could ever do. It's available. How do you get it? Draw near to me. Are you going to get it resisting and rebelling against God? No. But even in your captivity, even in your pain, even in your desert place right now, wherever you are, if you'll draw near to God, he'll bring you peace there. And then if you continue there, if you're resilient, if you stand, and then when you've done everything to stand, therefore, he says, I'll bring the blessing of what I promised from the beginning. You just never, ever move. Stir that up. Stir that up. It's available. How? Draw near to me. He's calling the church. I'm telling you. He's calling the church. And he's saying, be this for the world. Be this for the nations. And my grace is sufficient to carry out the task. Paul's going to say that. Now, there's a word here that I want you to understand is, is sound mind. We understand grace, the power of God. We understand that God by the love of God to a certain degree. We're learning how to love like God loves, but we're far from it. Would you agree with me? We're getting better. But here's the point that I really want you to understand. It says, and a sound mind. That word in the Greek actually means the abilities, the supernatural ability to make good decisions. I've given you the supernatural ability to make good decisions. I didn't give you, stir that up. What? The ability to make good decisions. How many in the room need that? God, it's available. It's there. How do you get it? You stir it up. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings. <laughs> oh, that, that won't preach in today's culture. <laughs> I 
I want to stop right there for a minute. In Jeremiah, in Jeremiah, in Jeremiah, God says, there's a bunch of prophets of mine that are saying, peace, peace, peace. And I'm not saying peace, peace, peace. They're saying a lot of different things and saying I'm saying it, and this is what I'm saying. I'm going to put you in captivity. <laughs> and in that captivity, and because of that captivity, you're going to realize your way didn't work. And I'm doing it because of my kindness and my love for you. So that you'll realize you need me. And then you'll come back to me. And when you do, and you do it from the very moment you start doing it, I'm going to bring peace to you. And I'm going to bring it to you through this heathen boss of yours. Somebody needs to hear that right there. You start drawing near to me, and through that heathen boss to treat you like dirt, I'm going to bring peace. And then if you're persistent, everything I promised from the beginning. And then I'm going to bring you out of captivity. I'm going to bring healing to you. I'm going to bring restoration to you. I'm going to bring all this stuff to you. But what we want in the church today is this easy listening. All I have to do is show up and fill a seat. Or, or be baptized or just proclaim the Lord Jesus and all these blessings are mine. And, no, and God says, no, 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 no. You've got to draw near to me. You've got to come after me. You've got to get to know me. You've got to align yourself with my way. You've got to do things like I do them and that automatically brings the blessing. And if you keep doing things resistantly and rebelliously, you're going to reap. It's not like the New Testament cross, what Jesus did on the cross, eliminates the idea of reaping what you sow. It just doesn't. Jesus said that. But somehow we listen to prophets and preachers who are teaching that all you have to do is this and all this is for you and there is some truth to it. But they want you to get it without discipleship and it's impossible. It's not an evangelistic message. It's a discipleship message. So let me finish reading this because I've got just like no time left. His prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. How do you share with him in his sufferings? According to the power of God. Who has saved us and called us to be holy. That is separated out to God's purpose. Calling not according to what we can do, but according to his purpose. And the power of God working in our circumstances that can actually do it because it's sufficient, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. But has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior. Verse 12, for this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know who I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Verse 13, hold fast to the pattern of these sound words. <laughs> In chapter 2, verse one, it says, be strong in the grace that it is Christ Jesus. And, and then on down in, in the verse 9, I think it is, he says, but the word of God, it's not chained up. It's actually going to do what it was sent to do. He, he's not concerned about that. So we have to have our purpose of the church. We have to understand that it's, 
discipleship and there's an anointing of grace upon us and we're saved to learn and to train other people and it doesn't matter what our maturity level is we haven't learned everything we need to learn about the anointing god has on our life the purpose he has the the provision that he's going to bring as we depend on him and we've got to divide the word of truth we've got to do that well we've got to make sure we do it well listen to this i want you to i want you to hear what god says in the book of Jeremiah, and I'm closing right here. In the book of Jeremiah, he says this. You're going to be in captivity. If you pursue me, I'm going to bring you peace in the midst of your captivity. But you're still going to be in captivity. And I got a time frame on that captivity. And it was prophesied already. It's 70 years. But in the midst of that captivity, I already know the time frame. <laughs> oh, that was so good. I already know the time frame. And in that captivity, you're going to be there. But you're going to have peace in the middle of it. And I'm going to bring it through Nebuchadnezzar. If you will continue to pursue me with all your heart, then I'll give you everything that I promised from the beginning. I'll bring you back. I'll restore you. I'll have this. You'll have that. It'll be redeemed. Yada, yada. How many need stuff redeemed and fixed in your life? He says, I'll do all that. What do you got to do? Draw near to me. Just stay in that space. And then he says this. See, you, you got to take all the scripture in context or you miss what God's saying. He says, in captivity, using a heathen man to bring you peace. And he's my servant, the Lord says. I'm going to do all this. I'm going to restore. I'm going to be like a grandmama and granddaddy that's bringing too many Christmas gifts to you. Because I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a future and a purpose. If. If you draw near me with your whole heart. Some of you today need to make a commitment to the word of God. You need to understand that this is not just another book. And it's not having the idea that you just don't understand it. Get over your bad self. Find some help. There are men and women in this church who will disciple you. They want you to succeed. Do not allow yourself to stay there any longer or you're going to be in captivity. And then you've got to begin to pray. That is, communicate with God. I'm uncomfortable with the prayer. Get over your bad self. Get some help. There's people in this church, men and women, who will disciple you. Yes? Because the church's purpose is disciple. So you need to, you need to not make any longer, any, any excuses any longer. And then the other group needs to say, Lord, do you mind if I share? You sure? I think I had a word for Michael. <laughs> I was counseling somebody else this week, and, 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 and the word on them was, you know, you can do all this other stuff, but it ain't going to bring victory. It doesn't even have the ability to. you got to do this one thing right here to actually get victory. You know, you've got to start doing it. When you start doing that, maybe you can add these other three, and these aren't bad things. That just doesn't have the ability to bring victory. We talked about that last week. I think the word had, uh, Lord had a word for Michael and me, so I'll include me in this. And he was like, he, he was like this. He says, I mean, I don't know if y'all know this guy, but this is one of the most intelligent people I know. He, he remembers everything I say. He, he tells me stuff I say four years later, and I'm like, what? Did I say that? Yeah, you did. Really? That's brilliant. And I just ask him, I just ask, I just ask him if, if, 
if he was going to keep hoarding that stuff or was he actually going to write stuff down like the Lord told him to? Was he going to continue to be a hoarder of the information God had bestowed upon him throughout the years or was he actually going to write it down? The Lord was asking him to write and this is... There, there, and, and, and he is insecure about being... And, he, and he's locked up in this idea of I'm having to... You know, it's, it's like, you know, saying to all of us today are going to go out and run a marathon when we get done at 10, 45. We're going we're gonna to run it, and we go, I can't run a marathon. And that's how we get locked up. And God said, I ain't asking you to run a marathon. What I'm asking you to do is do 10 sit-ups. <laughs> Let's start with 10 sit-ups. And, and, and then we'll walk around the block. But all we see is, I can't run a marathon, God. God says, don't do that. Just do this right here. Get moving to this thing that God has prepared for you before the foundation of the world that only his grace can accomplish. Only the anointing of God can accomplish it in your life. Because you know him, you believe the word, your, his presence is on you, and you know that you have the ability and the power and the love and the wherewithal mentally to make good decisions about what God's telling you to do to be successful. That's the anointing of God on this church. I think that's the anointing of God on the church if we'll listen, if we'll come back to him. Amen? I stand for closing prayer. Thank you for tolerating me 10 minutes and 33 seconds longer than I was supposed to go. I think they reset the clock after Michael finished. I think he's the problem. <laughs> Anybody challenged by this at all? So this week, from what I understand, we're going to have a printed through the Bible in the Year program, a reading, or a reading deal, yeah? And you can go online and get it as well. But until then, Jeremiah. And if you don't have a Spirit-Filled Life Bible, we're selling them out there in the lobby. We've got all kinds of versions. They help you with the commentary that's in them from a Spirit-Filled Life, from a Spirit-Filled perspective. Father, in the name of Jesus, some of us need to be baptized making a public profession of faith in you and recommitting our lives to you. Some of us, Lord, need to commit to your word and your way and not expect your blessing without actually pursuing you. And sitting in a church pew or seat is not pursuit in a way, God, that's actually going to bring the kind of success that you want to bring and the victory of from captivity that you want to bring. You want relationship with us. You want dependency. You want us to be dependent on you. Knowing that we can only do this with you. And it's not legalistic and it's not religious. It's free. Kelly said it's joyful. So, Father, as we go forward, why don't you lay hands on somebody beside you? I like this. Let's say it this way. As you go forward, say it after me. As you go forward, as we pray over one another. As you go forward, I pray that you would stir up the gift by the laying on of my hand. And I pray that there would be a desire, a burning desire, that they would burn up on the inside with passion for the Word and the ways of God. And nothing could keep them from it.
Father, I just pray against manipulation. Say it. Father, I pray against manipulation. I pray against ideology that is contrary to your word. I pray we not be like past people in Scripture that says your word is too hard. That we would say yes, Lord. I thank you for that. I pray in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Amen. amen.